Well, good evening, brothers and sisters, and we are in our study in this wonderful letter in the book of Philippians, the joy letter that Paul writes to this church in Philippi. And I must say, I've been encouraged studying and teaching through this letter, this book. I've learned so much in the last month or so that we are busy with it, and I pray and I believe that you do also. And Paul is not going to hold back today. Man is giving it out today and you need to sit upright, listen, be attentive at what he's going to say. He's going to talk about the enemies of the cross. So let me just remind you with whom he is dealing here. Paul is addressing in this church the Judaizers. These are the people who came out of uh, a Jewish religion. And now these people come into the churches in the first century and they're trying to pull the people back under the law which sits in the Old Testament. And it happens today so often that people are still trying to do it. You remember there in chapter 1 verse 15 when Paul is sitting in, in jail, in prison and he warns about these men. He says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and from strife. Their whole ministry is a ministry of strife. He even warned the people in Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, that from amongst them in the church, some men will stand up pulling people after themselves. It's because these men have got an agenda. It's envy. And it's strife. There's continuous envy and strife going on. And these people, Paul says, is coming in. In verse 16, then in chapter 1, he says, The former preached Christ from selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. And not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains. And you would remember when you were in that study, and you can go back and have a look at that study, That selfish ambition there is like electioneering. It's like a politician trying to win some votes for him. In other words, people need to like me and and, and I'm going to say all of these words to please you so that you like me and then you can vote for me. And, 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 And true as politicians do, you have to, if you want to win those votes, rubbish your opponent. This is what they are doing here. They, they go out with selfish ambition and they are not sincere, supposing to add affliction to Paul's uh, chains. They can't take him on on his doctrine. They can't fault his doctrine. They can't fault him about morality. But all these other things, they say Paul is not good enough. You know, they called him droopy eyes. He had, a, he had an infirmity in his eyes, which was runny eyes. He was a short man, apparently, and bald-headed man. And that a lot of things to say about Paul. A lot of things. You read through the Gospels and Paul say, you know, they even came to him and said, Paul, when you are with us, you're the softy. But when you write your letters, you are so hard and so harsh. It's all attack, attack, attack against this man of God. Now, Paul is going to address it now here as we come into our study into chapter 3, verse 17. And I want you to follow in your Bible and to notice what Paul is saying now. Remember, the Judaizers is coming into the church trying to pull people back under the law. They are preaching a different gospel. And even these men who's got selfish ambitions is preaching a different gospel. They read out of the same Bible, but it's different. You need to listen. In fact, Sunday we're going to come in our study in the, in, in the letter of John to, to test every spirit. We need to test them. Now, Paul says here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, he says, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk. As you have us for a pattern. Now, two things here. He says, see, an example is the word that's used here for example is some mimites. It's the word mimic. 
That's where we get your English word mimic from. In fact, Paul talks uh, about this earlier on in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, 4 verse 16. He says, be an imitator of me. He uses the word mimet, mimetes. And that means to mimic me. I, I get this picture of a young boy when his dad walks in front of him and he walks behind him and he mimics his dad. He, you can say he copycat his dad. He mimic him. Everything. If he dads walk with a limp, the boy will walk with a limp. If the dad hop, skip and jump, the boy will hop, skip and jump. That's sort of the same idea that Paul is talking here. And he uses the word walk. Uh, he says, and note those who walk like I am walking, like Paul is walking. And then he uses a second word here, and that's the word pattern. Pattern. And that's a little bit more firmer. And the idea here is back in the day, then they had these iron coins. And they will make a mold. And they will come down on this coin with force. With like a hammer blow. With force, they will come down on this coin and bang. And when you pick up that coin in the... In, in the firmness, in the strength of the iron, will sit this image. That's the pattern. And then you will bring another iron coin and the hammer will come down. Bang! And another one. Bang! And once you take those three or four coins and you put them next to each other, the image will be exactly the same because it's the same mold. May I say to you that you and I are formed into the image and into the mold and the likeness of the Son, Jesus Christ. If you see any other deviation from the Son of Jesus Christ in those who you are follow, then it's the wrong mold. This is why Paul comes and he says, take us as an example, walk as we walk, but more so follow our pattern. Let the hammer blow of Christ come down and fashion you into the image of His Son. Now, I trust Paul absolutely because if I read about his whole account on the road of Damascus, the hammer blow came down. He met Jesus Christ personally and that mold was etched into him. And now he can turn around to you and to me and he can say these words, have us as a pattern. Now, let me say, if you haven't got the pattern of Christ, you've got no grounds, absolutely no grounds to tell other people to have you as that pattern. It's such a beautiful picture that Paul uses in this particular way. Now, you may ask, what is this pattern? What is the characteristics or the, or the signs of this pattern? And we are studying in the book of Philippians, but I'm going to go now to Titus. When Paul teaches these two pastors, Titus and Timothy, and he explains to Titus the pattern there in Titus chapter 2, verse 7. Now, he talks to, he writes to Titus, he says there, In all things show yourself to be a pattern of good works. There's the word, a pattern. Bang! The pattern of Christ. The good works which the foundation of is Christ. He's our example. He says, to, to, to first of all, to Titus here, he says, we have him as a pattern. And now he explains to me, he says, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Not only words, but deeds. I say so often people don't Listen to what you say. They look at what you do. You can sing like an angel. But if you walk like a pig, that's what the people is going to remember. You can talk about love. You can have all the oracles of love. You can read poems about love. But if you do not, if you do not practice love, then there's nothing. You can talk about righteousness. You can... Quote all the scriptures about righteousness and have the best books about righteousness. 
But if you do not practice righteousness, then you do not have the pattern. And this is what he's explaining to Titus here. He says, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, a pattern in doctrine showing integrity. In doctrine showing integrity. What, what does he mean by saying in doctrine showing integrity, Titus? Well, here he means to be settled in your understanding of the scriptures. That is the pattern. Paul was settled in his understanding of the scriptures. He walks into Athens amongst all of those clever people, amongst all of those statues of the foreign gods. And then he preaches to him because he was settled. And then he goes in amongst the Jews, the Pharisees, in the synagogues. And they hated him for that. But he was settled in his understanding of the scriptures. I find it fascinating these days that people jump like the waves of a sea between certain understandings of the Bible, of the doctrines of the Bible. And you know where the problem comes from? Today we follow this teacher and this teacher is so wonderful. But his understanding of certain aspects of the Bible is different. And now we follow it with every single thing we've got. Until we find another teacher or a, another a superstar arising up. And now we all flock to this man. And this man's understanding of that exactly same part of the Bible that this first teacher had is different. Now all of a sudden we say this man is in error and we drop what we've believed there. And now this is the right one. And now we throw all into this one. That's not settled in the scriptures. That's not bang the pattern which Christ gave us in his logos. And this is important for Paul to write as he says in doctrine, show integrity. Have you got the integrity in the doctrine? You know, or is somebody coming to you and, and they tell you so a story or a book that somebody wrote? You know, this person wrote a book. Let me just tell you, if you read somebody's book, it's his sermon, it's his code of belief. And if that, if that do not match up with this book, burn it, throw it away. Those preachers you are following, so you, you need to test my spirit by all means. If I devi away from this word, turn this off. Turn this off, don't listen to me anymore. But those preachers who turn away from this and have their own little pet, <laughs> pet beliefs, and people are like waves in the wind, tossed to and fro, unsettled in all their ways. He says, no, no, no. Have the doctrine showing integrity, reverence, show reverence, incorruptibility. You can't be corrupted by gossiping or by now all of a sudden we don't like this. Now I'm corrupted by that. And now I'm corrupted by that. You see, we're coming back to Paul who says, he says, have us, Paul, as a pattern. It is cast in the eye and it can't be molded anymore. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that no one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. You know what he's saying here? He says, your accusers, let them be ashamed, having nothing to hold against you, against your good works, your good works. <laughs> it, is, it is so interesting here because the shame that they will try to throw upon you will turn into a shame to their embarrassment, to their embarrassment because of your good works. If people look at your good works and they bring that out, like Paul, if they bring that out as something that you've done wrong, you know, shame on them. This is what he says here. He says shame on them. So there, there we have the pattern, and there's many more. I'm just picking one out. I can read to you out of Timothy when he says the same things to Timothy, and he says it in, 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 to the church in Ephesus as well. So let's continue on now in verse 18. He says now, uh, walk uh, according to our example, mimic us 
and then and then have us as your pattern as a pattern to follow now in verse 18 he says for many walk many many walk of whom i have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of christ this is a sad indictment against many because that's what he says he says i warned you now he's weeping he came to a point where he realized how serious this is and then in verse 19 he gives characteristics of how these men is and what the modus operandi is he says whose end is destruction they're going to come to nothing whose god is their belly and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. You see, it's all about themselves. It's all about themselves. He says, these men are enemies of the cross. The cross is a place of sacrifice. It's self-sacrifice. Jesus Christ went to the cross and he sacrificed his life for you and for my sin. He showed sacrificial love there unconditional love there that's what the cross means the cross means death to the old man he nailed our sins and accusations against the cross that's what the cross means but these men they are enemies of that cross they preach a different gospel they don't preach the gospel of the cross they come in like i said with legalistic terms they come in with agendas to follow them he says it right there he says their bellies they whose god is their belly sensuality it's, and it's not only money and we get so many money preachers these days you turn your tv on and they will go on and say just send your money send your money we need to keep this tv station going and and if you send, just keep on keep on doing that it's for their own belly uh, and, and it's not only money. Yes, we look at the belly to feed it, but it is for, for status, for status to be somebody. All of a sudden, I've got a few people who's following me and now I'm feeling important. That's feeding your own belly. And this is what he wants there. He says, whose glory is the same. And they've got their minds on earthly things, you know. They quarrel about earthly things. They don't care about the souls. I've, I talk out of experience. I've seen it with my own eyes. They would have quarrels about themselves and to get their agenda and their points over, forgetting about the hurt to souls. It's the souls which is the heavenly things. Nothing else. You know, in, this is where I'm going to go to Timothy. Uh, you know, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, he writes now to Timothy, the same things here. He says, if anyone teaches otherwise that does not consent to wholesome words and even words of your Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Paul warns him here, Timothy. He says, if anyone comes here in Philippians chapter 3 verse 18, he says, for many, there is many of them out there. And he says now to him, he says, if anyone teaches otherwise do not consent it does not consent wholesome words wholesome is is uplifting words is building words it is living words it's it's up he says or even words of your lord jesus christ if, if they go away from the words of your lord jesus christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness if if their doctrine doesn't come to godliness what then paul Verse 4, he is proud. There's pride in that man or that woman or that church. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter whether you walked with the Lord for ages. Knowing nothing, nothing, but he's obsessed with disputes. Obsessed with it. Everything is a dispute. If you do not agree with me, it's a dispute. <laughs> And arguments over words. Arguments over words. The Bible is so true. From which comes envy, jealousies, strife, that's quarrels, reveling, and evil suspicions. 
unless rang, a useless wranglies of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth. The truth is ripped away from it. Who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. There you go. There you go. This is what Paul talks about. He says their bellies, uh, whose, whose God is their bellies. They do all these things for gain, for gain. From which such withdraw yourself. I told you Paul is really direct and hard. And again, I've seen this with my own eyes. I've experienced it. But you know what? God is good. You see, now he's going to give us the opposite of these men. Uh, if, if, he, if he showed that, he showed the pattern. I love that picture. Bang, in iron. He says, follow that pattern. And then he goes over to those who you should not follow. You should run away from them. He says it there to Timothy, from such withdraw yourself. You know, verse 20 now, he's bringing the opposite of these people. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you still waiting for the Savior? I am, but while he tarries, we've got still work to do, souls to preach the gospel to and to, to declare the good news. So he says this to them. He says now in verse 21, he says, For who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is even able to subdue all things to himself. If you want to do yourself a great, great blessing, listen to me. Open up your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and read there from verse 43 to 53. And, and, and you will be encouraged. Go and do that. I, I can't do it in this study now to read the whole passage. Because you know me, I will start teach out of that. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 43 to 53. He's going to talk about this lowly body which is going to be transformed into a glorious body. It's all there. It's all there. I can't wait to teach through 2 Corinthians again. Now, I believe verse 1 of chapter 4 belongs to verse 3 for this reason, because he says, therefore. Therefore means, now we apply that. Now that I've given you these things here, therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. He is really taught hard to them. He, he really gave it to them. He says, you know, follow mimicas. Use us as your pattern. Look out for these people who are enemies of the cross. And then he goes on to say, our citizenship is in heaven. And now he comes back and he said to them, stand fast. And that's what I'm asking of you. May the Lord bless you, my brother, my sister. Uh, I can't wait until next week and uh, uh, for the next part. And we're coming now in chapter 4. And we are nearly finished with this book. May the Lord bless you. Amen.